Americans look to the home as a source of domestic security and tranquility, particularly the family, to contain the fears of an insecure world. Consumer items became a popular way of expressing the opportunities of wealth. Marriage and family became a way of expressing freedom from wartime sacrifice and insecurity abroad. The home front during the first part of the Cold War was much different from the total warfare that represented the First and Second World Wars. As the Korean War showed, a new type of warfare had emerged, called limited war, which involved limited objectives that did not need the entire U.S. economy to be restructured to fight, nor full conscription to be implemented. All the wars that the U.S. has fought since the Second World War have been limited wars. Post-war period was a time of incredible change in the United States. The economy boomed, the standard of living skyrocketed, and suddenly people had disposable income. This brought about a new age of consumerism, where people bought the latest products off the shelves to show their status. Women would hold Tupperware parties and discuss the newest Avon product line. Men drove flashy cars, smoked Marlboro or Camel cigarettes, drank Bud and watched football. To many nostalgic Americans, the 1950s were the height of American culture before it went all to hell in the mid-1960s. The reason why the U.S. quote, went to hell, was because of a remarkable demographic boom that began in the late 1940s. In the aftermath of the Second World War, soldiers returned home to their loved ones and got busy, leading to a remarkable phenomenon, the baby boom. Starting in roughly 1947, married couples churned out baby after baby, bringing a major demographic spike that has had long-term significant consequences that are apparent to this day. This generation, known as the baby boomers, include my parents, aunts, and uncles. Baby boomers were typically born between 1946 and 1964. The trend was undeniable. In 1946, live births in the country increased by more than 150% between January and October, with some 339,499 babies born in that month. In 1954, the annual number of babies born went above 4 million, a figure that was maintained until 1965. The U.S. population skyrocketed, with a large portion being under the age of 25. This demographic bulge would follow these kids to this day, as they are now retiring, and force the government to accommodate them with the construction of elementary, middle, and high schools, then expanding universities, then finding jobs for them, and then taking care of their children, known as the Echo, or their grandchildren called the Millennials. One reason for the boom was the age at which couples married dropped dramatically after 1947 and stayed low into the 1950s. The average age for women to get married was 20, and for men, 22. The percentage of couples getting married also increased significantly from 60% in 1940 to 66% in 1950. By 1960, the number had gone up further to 68%, but dropped off steeply after the boom to 63% in 1970. This was because as baby boom women became educated, they delayed getting married or not at all. Fewer marriages took place. Access to birth control meant that couples could have fewer children, and those children had a greater chance of survival. Also, as women became less reliant on men for a life and became more independent, the divorce rate increased. Age-old traditions of staying together for the children were abandoned in favor of safety or happiness. Elaine May argued that the demographic explosion was an expression of the security Americans sought in private family life and the home because of the much more insecure world they faced. More important for the long run for the American people was the growth among liberal Democrats of Cold War liberals who endorsed and even fueled Cold War aims. At the same time, Americans were getting educated in vast numbers. This was a byproduct of the GI Bill passed in 1944, which offered veterans access to a free university education. This, in turn, helped to stimulate the post-war economy, with $14.5 billion going to universities to teach students, but also to conduct research that would end up transforming the U.S. economy. This group formed Americans for Democratic Action, which was led not by a politician, but by a historian, philosopher, theologian, and socialist named Reinhold Niebuhr, who was perhaps the most well-respected, influential thinker in America in 1946. In a series of lectures and articles and books in 1946, Niebuhr laid out his justifications for the Cold War. He argued that the sentimental optimism, jingoism, and theory of progress that had dominated the country between 1900 and 1930 was dangerous. Human beings were prone to evil and did not recognize the limits of human power, all of which meant that humans had misused their freedom and power. 
Think of the Milgram experiment, where people were directed to electrocute other, another person, played by an actor, in the next room. Reason and faith in science could not be trusted because they rejected religious and historical insights into human condition. Therefore, the communist belief in revolution through science and change in economic relations overestimated its ability to create a better society. By their very nature, Niebuhr argued, humans are inherently flawed and greedy, and so humanity could never reach the utopian and communist phase of history that Marx had predicted. Since all life is an expression of power, humans can only hope for a balance of power between good, i.e. New Deal capitalism, and evil, i.e. Soviet communism or dictatorship. Niebuhr's ideas resonated with the public, ready for explanations about why the confrontation between the United States and Russia over Europe was building. Abroad, instead of finding a world made safe for democracy, Americans found a world that was increasingly polarized into two opposing camps, Western or American versus Eastern or Russian spheres of influence, democratic capitalism versus communist authoritarianism. Making matters worse, once the Soviets detonated a nuclear bomb in 1949, right around the time that Mao Zedong seized power in China, the United States turned against itself, trampling all over the right to freedom of expression and thought enshrined in the Constitution. The glossy, shiny, consumeristic lifestyle that most Americans enjoyed in the post-war era only offered a thin veneer over serious internal problems driven entirely by fear and paranoia. In the aftermath of the Russian Revolution of 1917, the U.S. endured a period of hysteria known as the Red Scare. Given the communist movement's call for, quote, the workers of the world to unite, the U.S. government began a campaign that targeted anyone suspected of harboring communist or vaguely leftist views on behalf of industrialists who wanted to, to scale back the gains organized labor had made during the war. The Red Scare had a distinct anti-immigrant nativist tone to it, as many Eastern European immigrants were rounded up and deported. By the 1920s, the Red Scare lost momentum as members of the Communist Party of the United States, or the CPUSA, declined as wages rose thanks to prosperity. Arguably, the Cold War began on September 5, 1945, just three days before the Second World War ended. That day, a cipher clerk at the Soviet embassy in Ottawa named Igor Guzenko defected with 109 top-secret documents that revealed widespread spying operations in the West. The impromptu defection did not go as planned. Guzenko approached the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, or the RCMP, or Mounties, the Department of Justice, and the local newspaper, the Ottawa Citizen, but no more interested at least not at first. Terrified, Guzenko convinced his neighbor across the hall to allow him and his family to stay for the night. Watching through his neighbor's keyhole, Guzenko saw a Soviet hit squad kick down his apartment door and begin searching through his things. He called the police, who arrived only to, after a brief confrontation, the would-be assassins were forced to leave. Shocked at the audacity of the incident, the RCMP now took Guzenko seriously and called in Britain's Internal Security Service, or SIS, or MI5, remember Canada is still part of the British Empire, and the FBI to interview him. The Canadian government then established a royal commission to investigate Soviet espionage, and so word soon spread about the Soviet defection in Ottawa and the existence of a spy ring. The Guzenko incident appeared to confirm Truman's suspicions about Stalin's intentions and led to a second, more aggressive Red Scare, illustrated by espionage, subversion, false accusations, and character assassination. It is important to understand that throughout the Second World War, the Roosevelt administration openly worked with the Soviets to defeat the Nazis, and this logically involved sharing information or intelligence, including classified information. Remember, FDR ha held his own counsel, and so when Truman came to office, he was totally unaware of all the moving parts of his predecessor's policies. Now that the climate had changed, U.S. officials, who may have been operating on FDR's orders, were suddenly accused of being Soviet spies. The Red Scare lasted between roughly 1947 and 1956. In March 1947, Truman issued an executive order that created the Federal Employee Loyalty Program, which weeded out some 300 suspected communists or people who had leftist leanings. Congress quickly got on board the anti-communist crusade. Members of Congress realized that it was easy to score points against your opponent by labeling them a communist. In 1938, Congress created the House Un-American Activities Committee, or HUAC, to investigate disloyalty and subversive activities among American citizens, particularly those with communist leanings, but it had been relatively ineffective. However, in 1947, the HUAC emerged as the leading vehicle through which the Red Scare was conducted, taking aim at the film industry. 
It held hearings that investigated the Hollywood Ten, a group of screenwriters, producers, and directors, including Dalton Trumbo, who refused to testify before the committee and were found in contempt of Congress. Thereafter, Hollywood blacklisted or refused to employ anyone suspected of having leftist leanings, forcing writers like Trumbo to write under false names. His pen name went on to win two Academy Awards. Thanks to the Guzenko documents, Huak began to take aim at the Department of State, targeting an official named Algar Hiss. During testimony before the committee, Hiss denied it being involved in espionage. However, evidence later emerged that he had lied, and he was subsequently convicted of perjury and sentenced to five years in jail in 1950. After the fall of the Soviet Union in 1992, the Russian archives confirmed that Hiss had not been a Soviet agent. Other scholars have investigated the archives and concluded otherwise. This topic continues to be a great historiographical debate of the Cold War. Though not a member of HUAC, the leader of the anti-communist crusade in Congress was Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin, who had made a name accusing individuals of subversive activities regardless of whether or not there was evidence. Since then, the term McCarthyism has been synonymous with political repression based on unsubstantiated accusations. In February 1950, McCarthy gave a speech where he took aim at the State Department, which he accused, without any evidence, of being, quote, infested with communists. He held up a piece of paper and claimed to have, quote, here in my hand a list of 205, a list of names that were made known to the Secretary of State as being members of the Communist Party and who nevertheless were still working and shaping policy in the State Department, end quote. Even though the list was never produced, the media went nuts, forcing Congress to launch an investigation into the State Department known as the Tidings Committee. After months of hearings, including McCarthy's five hours of testimony, the committee concluded that none of the people who he had accused were communist or even pro-communist. Going further, Tidings took direct aim at McCarthy, describing his accusations as a fraud and a hoax designed to confuse and divide the American people and further his political career. Despite having failed to catch any communists in the State Department, McCarthy turned his attention to homosexuality in the Foreign Service. In an age of closeted homosexuality, being gay was considered a liability that the Soviets or other foreign enemies could exploit. His efforts were reinforced with the passage of the Internal Security Act of September 1950, which required members of the CPUSA and other communist organizations to register with the government. Members of these organizations were then stripped of their American citizenship for five years and barred from leaving the country. It also empowered the president the ability to detain people without charge if they were believed to have engaged in espionage, subversion, or sabotage. Truman vetoed the legislation, describing it as a threat to freedom of speech and association, a mockery of the Bill of Rights, and a, quote, step towards authoritarianism, end quote. But the House and Senate were able to overturn the veto. After the Republicans secured the presidency and majorities in the House and Senate, McCarthy was made chairman of the Senate Permanent Subcommittee on Investigations, where he continued his anti-communist crusade. However, by 1954, his campaign began to lose steam when journalists like Edward Murrow started to challenge his narrative. In March 1954, Murrow broadcast a special report on Senator Joseph McCarthy, which pieced together and analyzed audio clips of McCarthy's speeches against communism. He exposed widespread contradictions and outright lies. It was a smashing success. Whatever popularity McCarthy may have had at this point plummeted. Murrow then extended an invitation to McCarthy to come on the show and defend himself. McCarthy agreed and proceeded to call Murrow a communist sympathizer, an accusation that rang hollow against a widely respected broadcaster. Right around this time, McCarthy foolishly picked a fight with the U.S. Army, accusing it of negligent security at top-secret facilities. The Army responded, accusing McCarthy of seeking preferential treatment for one of his assistants. This forced McCarthy to recuse himself from the investigation and resulted in a televised spectacle known as the Army-McCarthy hearings. The Army hired Joseph Welch, a respected lawyer, to defend its position. The hearings reached a climax on June 9, 1954, when McCarthy accused one of Welch's colleagues of having ties to communists. On live television, Welch stopped McCarthy, saying, quote, Until this moment, Senator, I think I never really gauged your cruelty or your recklessness, end quote. When McCarthy tried to continue his accusation against the attorney, Welch angrily interrupted, quote, Let us not assassinate this lad further, Senator. You've done enough. Have you no sense of decency, sir? End quote. McCarthy's approval rating plummeted from 50% in January 1954 to 34% in June. 
The Senate later censured McCarthy for his actions, and he was stripped of the committees he chaired. From this point onward, he was a dead man walking in the halls of Congress. He died in 1957, before his six-year term had ended, only 48 years old. Cold War ideology created an atmosphere of crisis abroad and at home, but also a surprising degree of consensus where there was little conflict between liberals and conservatives. As much as McCarthyism was offensive to American values, most Americans were terrified of communism and they supported his efforts to weed out subversion. In a sense, Americans believed in containment abroad and at home, a phenomenon that Elaine Tyler Mary called domestic containment in her 2008 book Homeward Bound. Within the walls of the home, at the outbreak of the Second World War and the onset of the Cold War unleashed new social forces that needed to be controlled. This meant a return to traditional roles of men and women, but this would not last long. In the 1960s and 1970s, the highly educated baby boomers came to age and began to protest against these patriarchal attitudes. Containment at home took its parallels from containment policies abroad. Americans took pride in their family values and saw it as a bulwark against communism. For example, in July 1959, Vice President Richard Nixon met with Soviet Premier Nikita Khrushchev at the American National Exposition in Moscow. The exposition was a display of modern American life, including a model home and kitchen. However, when Nixon and Khrushchev stopped in the model kitchen, they sat down and engaged in a prompt debate about the merits of not the missile gap, a derogatory term used to describe the United States falling behind the Soviet Union in terms of missile production, but the household gap. Nixon argued the modern American home symbolized the essence of freedom. American appliances were the most advanced in the world, and these time-saving advances had resulted in a higher standard of living. In other words, American families were better off than Soviet ones. This was the American dream. The kitchen debate boiled down to values, individualism and freedom versus class warfare and oppression. So the consumerism of the 1950s was in a real sense an expression of freedom, democracy, and security in a world unfree and insecure. Nixon emphasized the ability of all Americans to be consumers. Quote, a house, a car, a television set, each the newest and most modern of the type we produce. But can only the rich in the U.S. afford such things? Any steelworker could buy this house. End quote. To Nixon, the fact that any American could buy these items was an indication that consumerism was an expression of democracy, a buffer against class divisions, and a safeguard against class warfare and ultimately communism. Indeed, Americans could finally fulfill their role as consumers. From 1947 to 1961, the national household income had increased by over 60%. Most of consumer spending went into household appliances, homes, automobiles, and recreation. In fact, between 1945 and 1950, consumer spending in general went up by 60%, but spending on household items increased by 240%. The post-war era also saw the dramatic transformation of the city, as white American families left in droves to live in inexpensive suburbs that began to pop up throughout the country. Remember, returning veterans were offered a generous benefits package of free education and low-interest loans from the Federal Housing Authority, which underwrote loans given to veterans. The first suburb emerged in Long Island, just off of New York City, in an area that became known as Levitt Town, where a vet could buy a home with no down payment and pay only $56 a month, which is $567 today, on a 30-year mortgage. As credit flowed to vets, new housing developments sprung up on the outskirts of major cities, leading to the issuing of a whopping 1.7 million mortgages in 1950 alone. In addition, Eisenhower pushed hard for the creation of a new, federally financed interstate highway system. Eisenhower viewed the interstate system as a matter of national defense. In 1919, as a young officer, he had participated in a cross-country motorized trek from Washington, D.C. to San Francisco along unpaved roads and wooden bridges, averaging about 5.67 miles a day over 62 days. During this time, as Supreme Allied Commander in Germany, Eisenhower took note of the highly efficient Autobahn, which had allowed Hitler to rapidly move troops from one front to another. In 1954, Eisenhower proposed the interstate system to Congress, which passed the Federal Aid Highway Act in 1956 to authorize the appropriation of $25 billion to construct 41,000 miles of two-lane highways separated by a grassy median and with cross-traffic limited to overpasses. 
The interstate system and the widespread ownership of automobiles advanced the growth of the suburbs. Cities underwent major changes as suburban communities sprawled into farmland. The growth of the suburbs, in turn, was portrayed as a protective measure against a nuclear bomb. Why would Moscow bomb Levittown when New York City was a much more alluring target? The same could be said about North Korea. Some proponents of suburbs argued that work in suburban factories created protection from labor unrest, class warfare, and communism. For example, the ex-president of the National Association of Home Builders and a banker argued, quote, generally large aggregations of labor in one big city or a central city plant are more subject to outside disrupting influences than smaller suburban plants, end quote. As a consequence, the home in the suburb, as opposed to homes in cities, became associated with greater security against nuclear attack and safeguard the classless nature of American society against communism. The post-war era was one of great anxiety about the proliferation of nuclear weapons. An article in Life magazine from 1959 portrayed young newlyweds who had agreed to spend their honeymoon in a bomb shelter in their backyard. They were shown descending into the shelter kissing to spend two weeks in unbroken togetherness. This couple symbolized the risks of the post-war era and the ways in which they could be contained within the home or, in this case, the bomb shelter. The Federal Civil Defense Administration concentrated on nuclear preparedness in the home. The FCDA hired Jean Fuller to develop its women's activities. Fuller volunteered to be a female guinea pig in a trench about 3,500 yards away from a nuclear test in 1955. Surviving the blast, she had proven that women could survive a nuclear blast just as well as a man. The FCDA then launched a campaign aimed at preparing the public to survive a nuclear test. For example, schools around the country had their students perform air raid drills, telling students to duck and cover beneath their desks, as if that would do anything to protect them from a nuclear blast. The FCDA sought to downplay the horrors of nuclear radiation with civil defense posters portraying radiation rays as sexy women. Fuller launched a campaign in 1958 called Grandma's Pantry, which referred to the bomb shelter and how to repair it in the event of a nuclear attack. The campaign tapped into the traditional symbol of security and preparedness, the grandma. It called for changing bottles of water every three months, rotating canned goods, and trained women how to cook using crude utensils. Before long, bomb shelters became quite common, with more than a million built in the 1950s, although only a small percentage of Americans built one. For a short time, this was a booming business with contractors advertising shelters ranging from a $13.50 foxhole shelter to a $5,000 deluxe suite complete with telephone, toilet, bunks, escape hatches, and Geiger counters. Americans were terrified. The fear of nuclear annihilation only furthered concerns about morality and sexuality. What would happen to American society in the aftermath of a nuclear blast? In 1951, Charles Clark published an important article in the Journal of Social Hygiene about the dangers of an atomic attack. He wrote, quote, Following an atomic bomb explosions, families would become separated and lost from each other in the confusion. Supports of normal family and community life would be broken down. There would develop among many people, especially youths, the reckless psychological state often seen following great disasters. Under such conditions, morality would relax and promiscuity would increase. End quote. Do you see what he did here? He linked the possibility of a nuclear attack not only to home life, but to sexuality as well, even suggesting that sexual chaos would result from a nuclear blast. Before long, sexuality became linked to subversive communist activity. Pre- or non-marital sexual behavior was viewed as a threat to the American home and used to help ferret out suspected communists. So if you're not married and you have sex, you might very well be a communist. Of course, I'm being sarcastic. But this was real. The FBI began investigating the sexual habits of suspected communists. A former State Department employee recalled that during his job interview, he was closely questioned about his sexual habits as well as those of his roommate. After the interview, investigators explained that the questions were necessary because homosexuals were easy prey for communists who used seduction to gain secrets. So McCarthy was not the only one engaged in a witch hunt for homosexuals in the State Department. For women, it was any sort of sexual behavior outside the marriage bed. American concerns about sexual communism were popularized in Mickey Spillane's novels, Kiss Me Deadly and One Lonely Night, where an evil seductress working with a communist seduced a hapless man unable to resist their beauty and became compromised. Public health officials even went so far as to hold a conference at the Massachusetts Society for Social Health, where they argued that women who challenged traditional gender roles posed a risk to national security. 
This, of course, led to further calls for women to leave the workplace and return home, and efforts to curb youthful promiscuity. In the end, the influence of the Cold War was all-pervasive, seeping into consumerism, sexuality, homemaking, and in the home itself. The containment of fear in the home and the repression of real diversity in America resulted in a bankrupt ideology of consumption and obedience that simply could not be sustained as the baby boomers came to age in the 1960s and 1970s. Unhappy with the status quo, blacks, women, and students began to demand a greater voice and break out of the supposed consensus of the 1950s. And, as American involvement in the war in Vietnam escalated, the unquestioning patriotism and blind support for the U.S. government began to lift, leading to an unexpected period of genuine rebellion that shook the country to the core.